Well, again, we want to welcome you. If you are new with us, we are in a series on the favor of God. And I want to thank Pastor Brandon for preaching last week. Here's where we're going to go. Next week, I'm going to have Dr. Greg Tonkinson from Valley Christian. He's going to close out this series. The week after that, I'm going to launch into a brand new series. We're going to be t- looking at the parables of God over the summer. That will be our summer study. And I hope that you are excited about that. It's just going to be really, really awesome. If you miss any of the messages, you can find them online on our YouTube page. Make sure to like and subscribe. You can get those notifications when they come out. So if you have been tracking with this sermon series, and I'm going to keep us on a good click this morning. So you get your sermon notes ready, get your pens ready, because we're off to the races. Are you ready? Here we go. If you've been tracking with this sermon series, then you will know that a common misconception about God's favor is the notion that God's favor will be expressed mainly through physical health and material prosperity in this lifetime. The fact is God's primary means of blessing us in this lifetime is the spiritual. He, um, Ephesians chapter one, um, he has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing God could has could have given, he has given. Now, that doesn't mean that God can't bless us physically and material. materially. He often does. And the full extent of God's that sort, that type of blessing or favor is going to come in the new heavens and the new earth. In the age to come, those of us that are redeemed will know only perfection and God's favor will be upon us in the best of ways. Sin will be removed. The curse will be lifted. There will be no more pain, no more disease, no more death or dying. You can eat whatever you want and never gain weight. (laughs) Amen. Amen. And if we get to heaven and that's not the case, forgive me, but I kind of assume that it is. But in all seriousness, the very best part of the new heavens and the new earth will be the manifest presence of God himself. Revelation chapter uh, 23, uh, 21.3 says this, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. But as I said, this is in the age to come. In the age to come, God's full favor is going to be poured out on you and me. We are going to be in paradise forever. And it's going to be incredible. We can't even begin to fathom how awesome it's going to be. Uh, But we just can't wait. Can't wait. Amen? But until then, we have to wait upon the Lord because we live in a dead, dying, and fallen world. And so we don't always have in this world the things that we think we need or that our hearts desire. But with that being said, that doesn't mean that we as God's children can't ask for God's favor in this life in tangible ways. God is the giver of good gifts after all, is he not? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? That's Matthew chapter 7, verse 11. God can bless and show favor in physical or material ways to whomever he wants, in any way he wants, at any time he wants. And there are plenty of examples of this throughout the Bible. God showed favor physically and material to people like Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, the nation of Israel, the early church. So it is not wrong for God's children to ask, Lord, bless me, bless me. But here's the key. Here's a key, and this is important that you get this. If it is God's will to grant what we ask, then we are blessed. If it is not God's will to grant what we ask, we are still blessed. Because as God's children, we know that he is working all things for our good and his glory as he conforms us into the image of his son in this lifetime. And folks, the greatest thing that God can do for you, the greatest gift, the greatest amount of favor that he can bestow upon you is transforming you into the image of his son, transforming you and me and causing us to be a sanctified and holy people in his sight. It's the greatest thing that he can do for you and me. And I'm going to say this. I said it in the other services, not in my notes. The greatest gift that God has ever given to me is my love of walking the narrow road. It really is. It is my, he, he's given me a heart that wants to obey him. I don't do it perfectly and I want to do it better. But I'm so thankful for that heart that he has put in me that longs to obey. And I, it's like the greatest gift. I love that. And if you're a believer, you know what I'm talking about. Um, God is transforming us. He's doing something in us that is so incredible and it's going to find its completion in the new heavens and the new earth in which we are perfect people living in paradise with our perfect God. So here's what we're going to do today. I want to explore three ways that you can ask for God's favor, three 
uncommon ways, I shouldn't say uncommon, three ways that I think are neglected amongst believers, but we should be praying in this way. Now, before I go over those three things, before we ever ask for the favor of God, there's a couple of things that we should do. And the first is this. The first thing we always want to do is we want to check our motives. James 4, 3 says this, you ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your own passions. Listen, if we ask for God's favor, only to spend it on our own fleshly passions and desires, we are acting no differently than the world around us. Anyone can pray selfishly, amen? I do it all the time. I'm a pro. You don't even have to teach people how to do it. We're good at it. Lord, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. Lord, make my life easy. Give me, make me rich. Make me this, make me that. Lord, 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 Lord. Just pour out your blessings on me so that I am healthy, wealthy, and happy. The fact is anyone can pray selfishly. Rather, the prayers of a believer are to be marked by maturity, which will manifest itself in prayers that are ultimately centered around God's kingdom, God's glory, God's will be being done. God, this is not about me. It is about you. It is about your kingdom, your glory. I am simply a servant here in this lifetime. So an honest check of our motives is always important before going and asking God for his favor. The second thing to consider is this. What is it that we truly treasure? Jesus himself put it this way, Matthew 6, 21. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. If what I treasure is ultimately centered around the things of this world and not the things of God, I have got the cart way ahead of the horse. The goal of every believer in this lifetime must first be this. Delight ourselves in the Lord. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, Matthew 6, 33. What's the greatest commandment? Matthew 22, 37. But love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The very first verse I learned after getting saved in 1987 as a 17-year-old kid, the first verse that I learned at a summer camp was this verse right here. Psalm 37, verse 4. Delight yourself in the Lord. Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. See, we want the desires of our heart. We just don't often want the first part of that verse. Delight yourself in him. Seek him first. Love him with all of your heart. Listen, when your heart delights in the Lord, your desires will inevitably be for the things of the Lord. That's just the way it works. When my treasure is the Lord, not the things that I get from him, but when he is my treasure and I'm seeking him and loving him, my desires are going to fall right in line with who he is and what it is he desires. It's just that simple. So we must consider what it is we truly treasure. I could stop the sermon right now and ask everyone in this room as an application point, when you walk through this door today, what is it that your heart truly treasures? The third thing to consider is we must ponder our purity. Psalm 512 says this, for you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as with a shield. Before I come and ask for God's favor, I need to ponder the state of my heart. Am I walking righteously with the Lord? Psalm 84, 11 says this, for the Lord God is a sun and a shield. The Lord bestows favor and honor. No good thing does he withhold from those, say it with me, folks, who walk uprightly, who walk uprightly. Proverbs 12, 2 says this, a good man obtains favor from the Lord, but a man of evil devices, he condemns. If we are expecting our prayers for God's favor to be heard on high, but we're cherishing sin in our heart, we should not expect those prayers of favor to be heard. Psalm 66, 17, I cried to him with my mouth and high praise was on my tongue. But if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Sin is ultimately the great disruptor in our relationship with the Lord. But here's the good news. Here's some great news. A true believer can never lose their salvation because of their sin. But a true believer can forfeit God's favor because of that sin. You can't ever lose your salvation. You're secure in him. No one can snatch you out of his hand. But his favor can be withheld when we're toying around, flirting with, and messing with things that he doesn't want us to have anything to do with. That is why one of the most powerful prayers you can ever pray before you ever ask for God's favor is this prayer right here. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Before you ever say, God, show me favor, pray this prayer. Lord, search my heart. Because the greatest gift you can give to me, Lord, is not the thing that I'm asking for, but is a heart that's wholly devoted to you. 
That's the greatest gift that you can give me. Lord, make me sold out for you. Make me in love with you. And the things that come from you are secondary. The last thing to consider is this. It is our posture before the Lord. Before, before we ever ask for God's favor, consider our posture. Proverbs 3, 34 says, Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Psalm 138, 6 says, For the Lord is high. He reg- or for, the, for though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. How many of you have ever seen a child in a supermarket who didn't get what they wanted have a tantrum? <laughs> yes. Now, there have been times I, have, I look at those parents and I go, shame on them. My kids would never do that. No, but here's the irony is I stand in judgment of those parents that let their kids have a tantrum. And then I go before the Lord and I say, Lord, I want this and I want that. And you owe it to me. And then he doesn't give it to me. And you know what I do? Come on, God, you owe it to me. I'm that little kid. There's no humility. There's no, remember what I told you. The minute you think God owes you anything is the minute your theology will be off in everything. God owes us nothing. Period. End of sentence. We must come before him as humble children and we can lay our requests before him. He is our heavenly father. And if we, though we are evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more will our father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? But we must come before him in humility and say, Lord, not my will, your will be done. Your will be done. Jesus summed up the attitude of those who are to be his disciples this way. Luke 17. Church, hear the word of God this morning. Will any one of you who has a servant plowing or keeping sheep say when he has come in from the field, come at once and recline at the table? Will he not rather say to him, prepare supper for me and dress properly and serve while I eat and drink? And afterward, you will eat and drink. Does he thank the servant because he has done, he did what he was commanded? So you also, when you have done all that you were commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. We have only done what is our duty. As God's children, we must humbly trust that our heavenly father knows what's best for us and accept whatever he chooses to give or not give to us. And if he doesn't give something to us that our hearts desires, we don't storm off. We're not angry. We're not upset with our God, are we? We praise him whether he gives or whether he takes away. We praise him always. Now, with all that being said, that's the groundwork for what I'm about to say. I want to share with you three powerful ways that Christians should be praying and can be praying for God's favor in their life, but often aren't. So are you ready? Here we go. The first is this. This is an important one. Ask God to show you favor by establishing the work of your hands. God, establish the work of my hands. Psalm 90 verse 17 says, Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So often in my own life, I do stuff and I make a mess. And I say, I make a mess and I say, God, bless this mess. I know you weren't in this and I didn't ask you to be in it, but there's a huge mess here. Will you please now fix it and bless what I've done? Instead of, instead of saying, bless this mess, how about even before I start, I say, Lord, show favor to these hands. God, establish the work of these hands, establish the work of my feet, establish the work of my mouth as I undertake what is before me. God, may you be in this. It is a prayer that Christians should be praying, but I don't know that we're often praying it because I know that I don't. I'm a pastor. There are days Days will pass sometimes and I'll I'll be busy, busy, nose to the grindstone. And I'm like, I haven't even stopped to ask the Lord to bless the work that I am undertaking for him. Psalm 127, one, you know it well. Unless the Lord builds the house, say this last part with me. Those who build it labor in vain, in vain. And yet so often I'm building the chimney, building the garage, building this, building that, putting the roof on. And I haven't asked God to be involved in any of it. And surprise, surprise, the house creaks, the roof leaks. There's all sorts of problems. 
because I tried to build that house in my own strength. Folks, it absolutely doesn't matter the nature of the work at hand. As believers, one of the most profound ways that we can ask for God's favor in our life is to establish the work of our hands. A great example of this, by the way, can be seen when the Israelites, let me give you an example. They came back from 70 years of exile in Babylon and they, one of the first things they had to do was rebuild the wall. They needed a wall around their country. <laughs> Nehemiah 6. So the wall was finished in 20, on the 25th day of the month of uh, Elul in just 52 days. And when all the enemies heard of it, all the nations around were afraid and fell greatly in their own esteem. Now listen to this. For they perceived that this work had been accomplished with the help of our God. God established the work of my hands so that my enemies know that you are with me. God established the work of my hands so I can accomplish crazy things like building a wall in 52 days to protect the city that we dwell in. God established the work of my hands. Instead of saying, God, bless this mess, God established the work of these hands, these feet, this mouth, this person that I am in my service to you. We see the same principle being played out in the New Testament as well. In the book of Acts, a Pharisee, a famous one by the name of Gamaliel, spoke these words about the early disciples. The early disciples are on the move. Is God with them? Of course he is. But the Pharisees don't know that. And so this is what he says. So in the present case, I tell you, he's talking to the other Pharisees, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You won't be able to stop them. You might even be found opposing God. Listen, folks, there are things that are on your heart to do, whether it be for the Lord or in your neighborhood, in your family, maybe at your place of work, and you're thinking there's no way that I'll be able to accomplish that. You're darn right, you can't. But guess who can? God can. And say, so whatever the odds are, no, no matter how impossible the task is at hand before you, you're thinking there's no way this is going to get done. Oh, really? How about you pray this? Lord, establish the work of these hands Establish the work of these feet. Every step I take, guide me, guide my mouth, guide my decisions. God, be in the work that is before me. Christians can start praying this and should be praying this. By the way, no task is ever too small. Too often we only seek God for the big things when our life are filled with a, middle, a million little things, right? And I know what you do because I do it too. You have a big thing that you need to get done. And so you go to God and you go, God, if you'll just take care of this one thing, I won't ask you for anything for a month. <laughs> right? Maybe two months if it's really big. And so we, 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 we try and bargain with God. God, establish the work of this project and I won't bother you with these projects over here. No, go before the Lord with all your projects. Lord, establish the work of my hand in all that I do. I am your servant and I'm here. I'm seeking you. I'm delighting in you. I'm here as your servant, God. So I go in your power, in your strength, establish the work of my hands. True story. And I, I didn't even have it in my notes, but I, I decided to tell it. When I was in seminary, um, one, of the, my, one of my favorite professors was a professor that I judged straight away, Dr. Henry Holloman. He's probably going to watch this, so... But he walked in the room, the first class, and I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's a nerd. He had a pocket protector, you know, and, and I'm so cool. Um, turns out he's the most godly man, he, just to be even in his presence, to know, he, he knows the word, it's just incredible, man. I mean, just, I'm humbled in his presence. But anyway, one day he comes into class, and I don't know how he, we were talking, he was talking to the class, and he goes, oh, my, my, uh, washing machine broke this morning. And he was telling us about it. And we said, well, what are you doing? And he said, well, the first, my, he, and he's humble man. He, he didn't mean this to brag or anything, but he just said, well, the, my wife and I were just there and we just prayed over it. We just said, Lord, we need to either get this fixed or replaced, but would you establish, you know, stop, go before us and take care of this. And I went to seminary for four years and I took Greek, Hebrew. I took a lot of theology. I took a lot of things, but you know what I remember? That story. That story. Establish the work of my hands and finding a new washer or dryer. God, it's broken. I don't want to make a move without you. Okay, secondly, a second way that we can ask for God's favor that is significant that Christians often don't do is this. Show favor to me and my house. 
Show favor to me and my house. Proverbs 3.33 says this, the Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the dwelling of the righteous. The home, of course, is the place where so many important things ultimately take place. So we would be crazy not to ask for God's favor in this area, yet I'm not sure Christians are asking for it. I can go days, weeks, and months without asking for this in my own family. Psalm 115.12, the Lord has redeemed us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. May the Lord give you increase, you and your, say it with me, children and your grandchildren. God, bless my house. A great example, and there's lots of of examples in the Bible of God showing favor to people's households. Uh, 2 Samuel 6, 11, the ark of the Lord ended up in the house of a guy by the name of Obed-Edom. And the ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months. And the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Another powerful example of God blessing not even an Israelite. In this case, it was an Egyptian who had an Israelite servant. Okay, and that was Joseph who ended up in Potiphar's house. Genesis 39 says this, so Joseph found favor in his sight, in the sight of Potiphar, and attended to him. And he, Potiphar, made him, Joseph, overseer of his house and put him in charge of all that he had. From that time, from the time that he made him overseer in his house over all that he had, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Now listen to this. The blessing of the Lord was on all that he had in house and what? Field. I'm going to bless your house. I'm going to bless your field. I'm going to bless your family. God's favor can be poured out on our families if we ask for it. But I'm not so sure we're asking for it. Ask God, you guys, to establish the work of your hands. Ask him to bless the house in which you dwell and watch what he can do. Now, when we think about God blessing our households, we often think, well, Lord, bless me with $10 million because that'll just, that'll take care of everything. Maybe 15. Let's just round up to 15 just to make eh, 20. 20 is good. But the fact is, folks, there are, no pun intended, a million other ways in which God can show favor to our households other than financially. For example, God can show favor to a person's home by protecting that house from division and dissension. Folks, we live in a divisive world full of dissension. The home should be a place of security where our kids and our grandkids can know this is safe. So ask God, God, make this a place, make my home, make my home. And not not just your home, I mean, your immediate, you and your spouse or you, whatever your house is, but my house, my, my offspring and all that are associated with my house. Let them find my house to be a place of security, stability, contentment, and peace. We can ask for God's favor by asking him to open the hearts of our children and grandchildren, or by giving our family a good name in the community. Listen, being a Christian in this day and age isn't easy, but that doesn't mean that we can't pray, God, let my family's name be, be honored in this, in this uh, city in which I live. As we live for you, God, show us favor in this way. What is so interesting about this is that God is probably blessing each of our homes and has been blessing each of our homes this last week, this last month, this last year, in so many ways that we are totally unaware. So we should probably not only be asking God, show favor to me in my house, but God, give me eyes to see when you do it. Amen? I bet that most of us could stop today and reflect and say, God, have you been blessing my house? And probably have a list a hundred things long, a thousand things long by the end of the day. So God, bless my house, me and my house. Lastly, we can ask God, and this is an important one, God, show, a, show favor, help me by showing me favor in the eyes of those who have authority. Genesis 39, 21 says this, but the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Wait a minute. Joseph was just in Potiphar's house and was overseeing all that Potiphar had. What in the world happened? Well, what happened was Potiphar's wife came on to Joseph. Joseph's a godly man, wouldn't do that. And so Potiphar's wife said, hey, he came on to me. And so he gets thrown into prison. He gets thrown into prison. Well, that's a pretty bad situation, right? How is God going to meet you in prison? How is God going to show you favor in prison? Listen, I don't care if you're in a dungeon. God can show you favor if your heart is wholly committed to him and you need his favor. Guess where God's favor can show up? In a dungeon. 
There it is right there. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Wow. Go figure. Here's why this is important, you guys. Here is why this is so critically important. Everybody just listen to this. I suppose if you get nothing from my sermon, get this. We live in a day and age where it's, we often feel helpless with those that have authority over us. We go, man, this world is big. The governments are big. Things are crazy. Things are out of control. We're just along for the ride and there's nothing we can do. Really? I don't care who holds all the marbles, who has all the gold, who's making all the rules. You and I have something that we can do in those situations. God, show me favor in the sight of those who have authority and watch what God does. I don't care if that is a prison guard or anyone else. God can do just that if we will ask him. But I'm not sure we as Christians are asking. God, establish the work of my hands. God, establish or bless my home. God, help me by showing me favor in the sight of those who have authority over me. In one way or another, we're all subject to someone. When I say someone, who comes to mind? Do you feel helpless with regard to that person. You don't have to. What does the Bible say? The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he directs it like a water course wherever he wants. Amen? It doesn't matter if it's king or prison guard. That person's heart is in the hand of the Lord and he directs it like a water course wherever it is going. Do you want favor in the eyes of your boss? Ask for it. If you want favor in the eyes of your neighbors, ask for it. If you want favor in the eyes of your own family members who maybe haven't liked you all that much, ask for it and watch what God can do. And you're thinking, there's no way, God. They hate me so much. There's no way, really. Is the God that you follow not able to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants? including showing you favor at any time. Exodus 3.11. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Listen to this. They're slaves. The, an entire race of people are slaves in Egypt and God shows them favor in the sight of those that are holding them captive. Is there nothing our God can't do? And then it says this. Moreover, the man Moses was very great in the land of Egypt in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Daniel 1.9. Again, Daniel's in the Babylonian exile at this point. He's a slave. And what does it say? And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Folks, it doesn't matter who has the authority, how hard-hearted that person might be, or how dire the situation might seem. God can grant favor if we will just ask him. Paul commanded the early Christians to pray for what? Favor in the sight of kings. First of all, then, I urge you, that supplication, prayer, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in high positions. To what end? To this end, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet, godly and uh, quiet life and godly and dignified in every way. God, show us favor in the sight of the king so that we can live for you. Dignified lives, quiet lives in this generation. Again, too often the temptation is to feel helpless with our, those that hold all the marbles. Folks, you don't have to. Start praying for God's favor. God, establish the work of my hands. God, show favor to my house. God, show me favor in the eyes of those who have authority. As Christians, when we start praying this way and we're delighting ourselves in the Lord, don't be surprised when God starts answering. By the way, you want a really powerful example of God showing favor to someone in very difficult circumstances? The Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul's on a boat. He's going to Rome. He's a prisoner. He's going to appeal before Caesar. And the boat sinks. The soldier's plan was to kill the prisoners lest any should swim away and escape. But the centurion wishing to save Paul. Well, well, well. Go figure. Kept them, that is the soldiers, from carrying out their plan. And he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and make for the land. And the rest on the planks are pieces of the ship. And so it was that all were brought to safety on the land because one centurion wanted to show favor to the apostle Paul. Listen, folks, I don't care if you're in a prison or if you're on a ship that is sinking, you can ask for God's favor in that situation. Amen? You can ask for God's favor on a sinking ship. And God can respond by saying, you got it. You got it. So folks, go ahead and ask. It's okay. 
Check your heart, check your motives, delight yourself in the Lord, seek him. Because when you do, your, your requests are gonna fall in line with what he did. Your desires are gonna become his desires and you ask and watch what God does. It doesn't mean that he'll always answer yes, but even if he doesn't, we're still blessed, right? Because he's working all things for our good and his glory as he conforms us into the image of his son. Just know this, it's okay to ask. You do not have because you do not ask. If then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven good, give good things to those who ask him? What I'm going to do here is I'm going to close in prayer. I'm going to leave a little time for you to ask God for his favor, whether that be over your family or the work of your hands or whatever it might be. Maybe there's somebody in authority over you. And it just seems a dire situation. Maybe you can ask for favor there. But before I do, I finish with this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Will you pray with me? Father in heaven, we come before you. And Lord, we thank you for the spiritual favor that you've shown us in this lifetime. God, every spiritual blessing you could have given us, you have given to us. And Lord, you're conforming us into the image of your son and you have paradise awaiting us. But until then, God, may we find, may you find us to be a people who seek, are seeking you and loving you and delighting in you. And God, you know the desires of our hearts in this room and those watching online Lots and lots of people with lots of different desires. And so God, we come before you now and we bring those desires to you and we lift them to you. So right now, go ahead and lift your prayer requests and ask for God's favor wherever it is you wish. Father, we know that you hear us and we lay these requests at your feet for your favor in each specific way. And God, as humble children, we will receive whatever the answer is, but we thank you for hearing us. We thank you that you are a good, good God and that your favor is upon us. We love you and we thank you. And we pray these things in Christ's name. And the church said with me, amen. Hey, God bless you guys. We'll see you right here next week. Have a great day. Amen.